A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad because of her, all you who love her. Exalt, exalt with her, all you who were mourning over her. Oh, that you may suck fully of the milk of her comfort, that you may nurse with delight at her abundant breasts. For thus says the Lord, Lo, I will spread prosperity over her like a river, and the wealth of the nations like an overflowing torrent. As nurslings, you should be carried in her arms and fondled in her lap. As a mother comforts her son, so will I comfort you. In Jerusalem, you shall find your comfort. When you see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bodies flourish like the grass. The Lord's power shall be known to his servants. The word of the Lord. In you, Lord, I have found my peace. In you, Lord, I have found my peace. O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor are my eyes haughty. I busy not myself with great things, nor with things too sublime for me. In you, Lord, I have Nay, rather, I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child. Like a weaned child on its mother's lap, so is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord, both now and forever. Dominus Fabescum, Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matthäum, The disciples approached Jesus and said, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child over, placed it in their midst, and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verbum Domini. Amen. Unless you turn and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> I think uh, this saint we celebrate today, Saint Therese, truly a, a modern saint, died at the end of the 1800s, has a lot to say, I think, to us in the situation we find ourselves in in the world today. It's a time of of distress with COVID and the United States. We've had racial unrest and we've had this tension going into our general elections. And today we continue after mass, invite everyone to join us in our novena to the mother of God for the night. 
for our country as we approach our elections. And, and depression, anxiety, other <clears throat> uh, psychological difficulties are all on the increase right now in our country. <clears throat> anxiety and fear especially. I, and I think today's teaching and St. Therese's teaching as a doctor of the church has a lot to say to that reality about trust, surrender, keeping our eyes on the Lord, serving him. You know, if we, if we look around at the waves like Peter walking on the water, uh, we can be filled with the wind and the waves. We can be filled with fear and sink, right? Take our eyes off Jesus. And Therese, who was in a cloister, focused intently on the Lord and knew a peace and a joy and a happiness. That's a model for all of us. St. Therese of the Child Jesus in the Holy Face, um, she was born in 1873, died in, in 1897. She's a doctor of the church, made a doctor by John Paul II. She was a Carmelite cloistered nun and patroness of the missions. And she died when she was only 24 years old. And she's always a, a patron saint for the World Youth Days. And, you know, we're reminded that she is, you know, was in the cloister for nine and a half years, died at 24. She is a model for youth. We're not, we don't think of her that way sometimes, but I think uh, in this age where our youth can be so, they're struggling with so many great challenges and difficulties and get caught up in different movements that might lead them astray, we have a great model here in this saint that holiness is possible for you as a young person in your youth. You know, it's not just for when we get older, but in your youth, this union with God is possible. She is known as the little flower. Um, in her autobiography, Story of the Soul, uh, she compares our souls of different people to various flowers. Um, she said all flowers are beautiful, you know, big and small. Some are at the feet of our Lord. You know, some might be, have a, a, a greater grandeur in one sense, and some may be more simpler, but they all reflect, reflect the perfection of God, and they're all beautiful. She would say that perfection consists in doing his will and being what he made us and wills us to be, and just following that. And so we don't need to look at the other flowers to compare ourselves. He made us who we're called to be, and we can shine forth you know, his majesty and his glory. She's also known for sending uh, roses. We make a novena, and people sometimes receive flowers as a sign of her intercession. And she spoke of flowers as small sacrifices that we can make. She's known for her quote unquote, little way, her way of simplicity and trust. She grew up in a middle class family, five girls. Um, her mother was a, a lace maker, her father a watch maker, and she struggled greatly with her sensitive nature, overly sensitive at times, being called spoiled. But at four years old, her mother died in her oldest sister became her second mother, and, but she would later, Pauline would later enter the convent. And this really traumatized St. Therese that she was so anxious about this that she would become ill with a fever and somewhat catatonic. And she received a miracle when Our Lady of the Smile, that beautiful statue, smiled at her. And she would later write, that in trial or difficulty, I have recourse to Mother Mary, whose glance alone is enough to dissipate every fear. Whose glance alone is enough to dissipate every fear. She entered Carmel with special permission at the age of 16. She was on a pilgrimage to Rome with a group, and she kind of charged ahead and asked the Holy Father to, for the special permission and a, a vicar nearby overheard this and obtained that permission. And she was in Carmel for nine and a half years before she passed away. Certainly a holy boldness, right, to go to the Pope and ask that. But 
She said her, her little way is the way of spiritual childhood, the way of trust and absolute self-surrender. And if there's anything difficult for modernity, it's trust and self-surrender. I think as we have more, have more means at our disposal, we want to control more, and surrender is just not part of our vocabulary. But she is a modern saint who is teaching this doctrine to trust God, to surrender to him. She would write a letter to a priest, a missionary in China, and she would say, sometimes when I read spiritual treatises in which perfection is shown with a thousand obstacles in the way and a host of illusions round about, my poor little mind soon grows weary. I close the learned book, which leaves my head splitting and my heart parched, and I take the holy scriptures. Then all seems luminous. A single word opens up infinite horizons to my soul. Perfection seems easy. I see that it is enough to realize one's nothingness and give oneself wholly like a child into the arms of the good God, leaving to great souls, great minds, the fine books I cannot understand. I rejoice to be little because only children and those who are like them will be admitted to the heavenly banquet. So Jesus tells us today in the gospel. In our world you know, is characterized by a, a will to power. And Pope Francis has warned us about a spiritual worldliness, you know, and that we can go and, and, have, and still make it about us, that you know, the holiness, the spiritual life, the journey is all about our efforts, our talents, you know, our work ethic and stuff. I did it, I achieved it. And we have Therese proclaiming her weakness, her inability to do great penances. She writes about that, that she sees the great deeds and penances done by the saints, and she realizes she can't do this. So she chose the little way, and she would speak about surrendering ourselves with confidence like a child who sleeps without fear in his father's arms. She would say that Jesus does not look for deeds, but only gratitude and self-surrender. She would say that it's wrong to find fault, to impose our views. Quote, we desire to be little children who do not know what is best. Everything is right in their eyes. You know, that's, that little way is about entering into a deep sonship with the Father, that he knows what's right. And that stuff going in my, on in my life, I can accept because it comes from his hands. He's allowed it to happen like a child. You know, a young child isn't questioning everything from their parents. They love their parents and they accept. This is my house, this is my home, this is my parents, this is where we eat, you know, this is what we do. And to have that kind of faith and acceptance in our life you know, is what we call to as an adult as well. She would say to be little by recognizing our own nothingness and expect everything from the goodness of God as a child expects everything from his father. That we have a, a good, good father beautiful song that says that we have a good, good father. And to know that, yes, there's great difficulties, there's crosses that he allows, but he wouldn't allow it if he can't draw good from it, if he can't work some good from that difficulty or suffering. She would say that nothing worries us, not even the amassing of spiritual riches. Do you ever feel that way? It's like, you know, we want to be serious about the spiritual life, we want to take our faith seriously, and we have this constant pressure on us. We just got to be better. This just ain't working. It's got to be better than what it is right now. I got to be better. And she's talking about trust and even trusting our progress to him. But she would say that, you know, God could make us a saint in an instant or at the end of our life before we die. You know, that's up to him. You know, that we accept and cooperate with that grace, but we even entrust our progress to him. And I think the difficulty sometimes is, you know, we can live in a world of comparison 
and we want to be above others. You know, then we feel okay. If I'm, if I'm doing better than my neighbor, then I'm okay. And she's telling us, keep our eyes on the Lord, you know, and, and follow him and accept, you know, his, his goals for our life and our progress. She said, our virtue is not our own, but God places the treasure in our little hands as we need them. Living in that present moment that God will give us that grace, might be even martyrdom. Won't have it before that moment, but in the moment I'll have it. And that's trust, right? We don't go into situations, or maybe if we saw the sufferings in our life that's to come, we might run away. Because we forget, well, in the moment, God will be there to strengthen us. And we can uh, you know, live in that fear. I heard some quote from Mark Twain recently. He said something to the artist. that said, I've been through terrible things in my life. And some of them actually happened. You know, <laughs> that we can worry about the future, what might happen, and not have this trust in God that he'll be with us in it. It says, finally, to keep little means not to lose courage at the sight of our faults. Little children often tumble, but they are too small to suffer grievous injury. You know, if we trust God, that yes, we're full of imperfections and shortcomings. Our Lord himself, who was perfect, you know, fell on the way of the cross you know, several times, accepted help from Simon and Cyrene was consoled by Our Lady's prayers and Veronica. You know, he, he knew the shortcomings, the weakness of human flesh. He was a model, you know, for persevering, accepting help, and trusting his father. She would write that, of course, we should like to suffer nobly. We should like never to fall. What an illusion. What does it matter if I fall at every moment? In that way, I realize my weakness. The gain is considerable. My God, thou seest how little I am good for, away from thy divine arms. And if thou learnest uh, me, if thou leavest me alone, well, it is because it pleases thee to see me lie on the ground. Then why should I be troubled? So she's telling us to be patient with our faults to bear with our weaknesses, and certainly the weaknesses of our neighbor. And it's wrong, she would say, to continually find fault, you know, to, with anything, with God's plan and with our circumstances and to try to impose our views. You know, children do not know what is best, that they accept everything is from coming from the hands of a loving father. You know, sometimes, Maybe it can sound like uh, that it's, you know, it's a, she would speak of it like an elevator, you know, carrying us up a shorter, quicker way. But I don't think it's a, an easy way in a life without suffering. She herself you know, died young, had tuberculosis of the lungs, you know, experienced basically this so slow suffocation. She would have to experience be treated with these painful medical treatments that were used at the day. It was excruciating. And on top of all that, living in a cloister with considerable difficulties in the community itself, she also suffered a, this trial of faith that the biographers write, this relentless temptation to doubt. And John Sayward describes it in an article, he says, the theologians tell us that this experience was not a purging dark night of the soul. St. Therese had already passed through the purgative way and was now in the unitive way, united to Christ our Lord in spiritual marriage. No, the purpose of St. Therese's trial of faith was of another order. Our blessed Lord wanted to bestow on his little bride the privilege of cooperating with him in the salvation of souls. He wanted her to hear the voices of the modern anti-Christian world, to hear them and resist them, and by offering up in loving union with Christ the suffering of mind they caused her to merit the grace of conversion for the unbelievers of, our, of her time and ours. So patroness of the missions, she 
you know, is helping to spread the faith by sharing in the, this darkness, this abandonment that Christ himself felt on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He felt that the weight of the separation that sin causes of lack of unbelief, which is the characteristic of modernity, a lack of faith, a secularism, a growing atheism. So she suffered that trial, I think something like a year and a half at the end of her life, to such a degree that she would write in her own blood, she pricked, I guess, her finger and wrote the creed out in her own blood, you know, to, to strengthen her, her faith. That's the little way, right? Accepting the trials, the difficulties that God sends us and allows us to participate in redemption itself. You know, to cooperate with that, to help others to come to faith. You know, I think, as I mentioned, today's challenging times, you know, it's a time to, to embrace faith, to live that faith, you know, to do the works of faith, to witness to that faith in our culture that, yes, is connected to morality, that, yes, is connected to the natural moral law that we are to uphold in our country and by the people we elect, you know, who we send uh, to run the country, so to speak. You know, that faith needs to drive everything, and she's a, a model of faith and inspiration for us today.